Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, John Michelle Dismuth. He'll speak on Chern Simon's classes, Bob Chern classes, and then other courses. Okay, thank you very much. So, I'd like first of all to say how happy I am to participate in this conference in honor of Jim Simons. My work has been centered in part in working on this secondary uh, objects that he introduced a long time ago with Jeff Cheeger, including in Giant Poetry with Jeff. And uh, I've been, in some sense, able to understand how deep and important they are. So, let me try, first of all, to just put my talk in perspective. So, let me remind you a little bit of the theory of differential characters. So, you give yourself a manifold, M. And basically, you can think of a differential character as being some current, which solves uh, an equation which is of the type dt, t as a current, is equal to a smooth closed form, omega, minus the current as a shaded to a cycle. So in other words, uh, differential characters we find altogether on smooth Durham theory on one hand and theory of cycles on the other hand. And actually the purpose of the theory is to study these refined objects. So my talk today is going to be related to the construction and properties of such refined objects like differential characters of, or Bot-Chan classes in the context of K-theory. So, let me remind you a few things about direct images in K-theory. So, for the moment, I will be extremely general and vague also. So, X and Y are two manifolds, say. And you give yourself some Grothendieck group K of X and K of Y of vector bundles. So in that category, you have the notion of a direct image, either in the category, say, of holomorphic vector bundles or current sheaves, or in the smooth category via FREDOM operators. And also you have a chain character map, which maps K-theory, say, to cohomology or Chow groups, and the point of this direct image theory is to understand to what extent this diagram commute. How will this diagram commute? And it's well known, say, that in the holomorphic category, the grothendieck riemann roch or in the smooth category, the families index theorem of a tiered singer, takes the following form. You introduce the top classes of Y and X, say, and you have the result that the tot of ty, churn character of the direct image, is given by the integration along the fiber, or the push forward, of tot of tx, ch of e. So I will try to explain how these sort of equalities, which take place in cohomology, can be refined either at the level of differential characters or bot churn classes. And my work, the thing that I'm going to talk about, is related to work of a large number of people, including Berlin Vang, Jeff Cheeger, Ezra Getzler, Gillet, Soulet, Matai Quillen, Lebeau, Bot Chen, and of course, Jim Simons. So, first of all, let me remind you a few things about the local, about the family's index theorem in its local version. So, I give myself a smooth vibration with compact fibers Z, which essentially carry, each of the fibers carry, will carry some Dirac operator. So I ask the fibers to be compact, even dimensional, oriented and spin, and I will introduce in each fiber a Dirac operator DS, which will act along the fiber Z. So basically the set of data is that you need to do this. You need to give yourself a metric, Riemannian metric, on the vertical tendon space along the fibers. 
you give yourself a vector bundle with metric and connection. You introduce the spinners along the fibers, which as is well known is a graded vector bundle. And also for each S on the base, you just look at the sections along the fiber Z of the tensored spinners, S, T, Z, tensored E. And so of course this vector space, which is infinite dimensional, splits into two pieces, the sections of the positive spinners and the sections of the negative spinners. And the Dirac operator for every S in the base is of course an odd operator, it exchanges positive and negative spinners. So let me vaguely remind you that the Dirac operator is a first order elliptic along the fiber and it's written in the following form, it's a sum of Clifford multiplication with respect to EI, Nabla EI, where this is a connection on the spinners tensored by E. So the family DZ of these Dirac operators is a family of Fredholm operators along the fiber. So it defines an element of K theory in the base, which I write index of D plus, and if the kernel of D plus and the kernel of D minus are themselves have constant dimension, that's exactly this difference bundle. So it's a difference of two vector bundles. If this is not the case, then you have to do something to make sense of the direct image of this index bundle. So the family's index theorem of a tier singer takes the following form. You have the chain character of the index bundle on the left hand side and you know that the family's index theorem tells you that it's integral along the fiber of some characteristic class which involves the A-roof genus of the tangent bundle, vertical tangent bundle and the chain character of the twisting bundle E. So our purpose now is going to refine this equality at the level of differential forms which is to say that imagine that the kernel of these Dirac operators is itself a vector bundle. It's a smooth vector bundle on S. And so I give myself a connection on this smooth vector bundle. So you have this smooth vector bundle on the base S. And then what I try to do is represent both sides in Chernweil theory. So in other words, first of all, I have the Chern character form of the index bundle associated to the given connection. And also I introduce some connection on the vertical tangent space and on the twisting bundle, nabla TZ and nabla E. And so I look at these two differential forms on the base. And so what basically I infer from this family's index theorem of a tier singer is that there exists some, there exists some smooth form, eta tilde, from the moment it's totally undefined, which verifies such an equation. D eta tilde is the difference of these two forms. So this is because they are necessarily cohomologous. So of course the question that you ask is the following. Can you try to give a sort of canonical construction of such a form eta tilde? So the form that we would like would be of course that it's canonical and it's, it's also it has some universality property in the sense that it has to be purely local on the base. It has only to depend on the geometry of the vibration completely locally. So of course if we do, are able to do this, that means that not only we're able to understand the family's index theorem, but also we're able to understand the proof of the family's index theorem. And of course we'll have to give a proof of this family's index theorem. So let me try to explain the strategy that we'll try to follow. We'll try to produce a family of differential forms, alpha t, which will interpolate between the two sides of the refined version of family's index theorem between the churn character form and the integration along the fiber form, this one being global along the fiber and the other one of course being local along the fiber. So, as my friend Jeff likes to say, I'm um, unavoidably led to introduce superconnections at this stage. So, superconnections is uh, an extension given by Quillen of Chernweil theory. So, let me try briefly to explain what this is. 
So now we forget a little bit about the family's index theorem. So I give myself a Z2 graded vector bundle, E equal E plus plus E minus over a base S. And I observe that the bundle of algebras N of E is naturally Z2 graded. You have the even part which preserves the splitting and the odd part which extends is E plus and E minus. And so basically what we will call superconnection is any odd, I insist on odd, first order operator acting on sections of the exterior algebra of the base, tensor product with E, which verifies Leibniz rule. So let me give an example of what a superconnection is. Just a simple example. So you give yourself a connection on the z degraded vector bundle preserving the splitting. And also you give yourself a nod section of E, that is a section which exchanges E plus and E minus. And AT for a given T is a sum of a connection and a nod operator. This is a super connection but is it's because it's globally hot. So once you have a super connection like this, you view it as a differential operator and you take it square. Exactly like in usual Chernivtsev theory, the square, which is the curvature of the super connection, turns out to be a tensor, which lies in this algebra. It's an even element of this tensor algebra, of this z degraded algebra. So once you have this element, you take its exponential, like when you produce a Chern character form, and you take its supertrace. Instead of taking its trace, like in usual Chern value theory, you take the supertrace. So supertrace is a z2 graded version of the trace. Instead of taking the sum of the traces on a plus and a minus, you take the difference of the traces. So I introduce this differential form here, which is alpha supertrace of exponential minus a squared with a phi, which is a normalizing factor with a 2i pi. So Quillen's theory tells us that this form is closed. It's an even form which is closed, and its cohomology class represents the churn character of the difference bundle E plus minus E minus. And the proof is extremely easy. It's based on, as usual, on Bianchi identity, which says that A commutes with A square, and also on the fact that the supertrace vanishes on so-called supercommutators. So in some sense, we have complicated chern theory. So why is it good to complicate chern theory in the context of my talk? <coughs> well, so let's go back to the infinite dimensional setting. So you have this manifold x with fiber z. And remember that I have on the base this fiber hs, which is hs plus plus hs minus. So these are fibers which are smooth sections along the fiber. So in effect, there is an infinite dimensional Z2 graded vector bundle along the fiber. Also, I do have the Dirac operator, which is an odd section, which exchanges the positive and negative part of the bundle. And so what I need to give myself now is I need to give myself a connection on this Z2 graded vector bundle. So connection on the infinite dimensional vector bundle. So to do this, I give myself a family of horizontal directions. And they basically, once I give myself a connection on the twisted spinners, I will decide that the covariant derivative of a section, that is a full section, in, U, in the direction U, which is a vector of the base, tangent to the base, consists simply in differentiating the section in the horizontal direction, in the lifted horizontal direction. So this produces a connection on this infinite dimensional vector bundle. Now from this, I construct a super connection on this infinite dimensional vector bundle, which is constructed as follows. So AT is the sum of the previously defined connection, nabla h, plus square root of t dz, where dz is a Dirac operator, 
And then there is some funny perturbation term, which I will not explain in detail, but which will be play an essential role in what follows, which actually diverges when t tends to zero. And this term is also odd, so that this makes an effect AT to be a super connection of this infinite dimensional vector bundle. And this T essentially is related to the curvature of the vibration defined by this family of horizontal directions. So you should think of AT as being some sort of Dirac operator on the full space but which is associated to a metric which is infinite in horizontal directions. So this analogy is a very important thing. You take a global Dirac operator, make the metric infinite in some directions, and then you get an operator which de degenerates in certain directions. So what does the local families index theorem says, say? So theorem I define again now in this infinite dimensional context exactly the object I defined before, alpha t, which is phi with a 2i pi supertrace of exponential minus at square. Observe here that at square is, is an elliptic second order differential operator, so in effect these supertraces make sense. So the theorem says first that alpha t is a real even closed form, its cohomology class is a churn character of the index bundle. Second thing, as t tends to zero, alpha t converges exactly to the differential form, which is on the, I mean, which refines on the right hand side of a T. Singer family's index theorem. And the third fact is that if kernel of dz is a vector bundle, as t tends to infinity, alpha t converges to the churn character form of the index bundle. So I've produced this way, this family of interpolating forms. The result number three is by Bell in Fair. So we, once we have this, we can play the churn simons transgression mechanism, which is we can write the variation of this family of forms, alpha t over dt, canonically as being the d of some form beta t, exactly as we would do in the context of usual Chern-Simon theory. And this way we calculate a form eta tilde, which is the integral of zero to infinity of beta t dt. All these integrals converge. And in effect, we have produced a form eta tilde, which has all the features we want. It solves the right equation. And it is canonical, it is local on the base, it depends purely locally on the geometry of the vibration. So it has exactly the features that we want. So let me try now to relate this form eta tilde to differential characters. So I state here a theorem which is based on work with Chigger and with John Lott also, which says that this form eta tilde can be expressed itself as a difference of two differential characters, since this form eta tilde refines exactly on the Chernvai theoretic objects, I mean refines, sorry, on the cohomology classes in exactly the right way. So I claim that eta tilde actually is a difference of two differential characters. One, the integral along the fiber of the differential character for Tz and E, and the other one, the differential character for the index for the index bundle. The proof of this result relies on the initial formula by Chigger and Simons expressing the eta invariant in terms of a differential character, the usual eta invariant in terms of a differential character, this for an odd dimensional manifold, plus results by Chigger and myself related to adiabatic limits of eta invariance. So what I'll talk about now is refined objects again in the context of holomorphic geometry. So assume now that X and S are themselves complex manifolds and that pi is a holomorphic map. 
give yourself a holomorphic vector bundle E, omega x, so I will give myself a metric along the fibers, so the fibers are z, so to define these metrics basically I will need to have metrics which are Kähler along the fiber, and also to have some consistency condition on these metrics, so for the moment say you can assume that x is itself Kähler and omega x to be a Kähler form of some metric on x. So of course this scalar form induces a Kähler metric along the fiber. I give myself GE to be a metric on the holomorphic vector bundle E, and I try exactly to introduce the object I gave before, which I call the Levici beta superconnection in that context. So of course here I take the horizontal vector bundle to be the orthogonal bundle to the fiber. So something extraordinary happens here, which is that this object, which is a perfectly smooth, first of all, it's introduced in the smooth category, it splits into two pieces, which exactly correspond to the splitting of the Dirac operator along the fiber into d bar plus d bar star. This global superconnection splits into two pieces, which verify essentially the same commutation relations as d bar and d bar star themselves. So AT splits as A second T, which is an holomorphic part, plus holomorphic part, and A second square is equal to zero, A prime square is equal to zero. So what is this good for? So again, I temporarily go back to the finite dimensional context. So for the moment, we will pretend that this bundle of sections along the fiber are themselves finite dimensional. So let's pretend this. I've still kept the notation d bar z, d bar z. So this represents a sort of finite dimensional Dalbo complex. So I now introduce the superconnection BT, which is Nabla H. Nabla H will be some holomorphic and median connection on this vector bundle here, plus square root of t, d bar plus d bar star, d bar star being some adjoint of d bar. So the fact is that in this context, we can express canonically d over dt of this superconnection form, representing the churn character, not only as a d of something, the d of something, this is churn Simon theory, but we can express it canonically as the d bar d of something else, which in this context involves the number operator of the complex. So it's d bar d over t of the supertrace of the number operator, exponential minus bt squared. So once we know this, this is a sort of heat equation formula, by the way, with respect to some highly non-elliptic operator, which is d bar d. What's that n is the number operator of the complex. So in other words, it's 0 on h0, 1 on 1, on h1, etc. So in the context now that we are in, that is in the context of this family of relative Dolbo complexes, so a, replace now H0, H1, HM by being just the relative Dolbo complexes, I introduce a new number operator. Actually, in that context, the number operator is slightly more complicated than a log number operator. So I introduce NT, which is N, that's the usual number operator of the Dolbo complex plus an even object which is essentially the horizontal part of the global Kähler form. Remember that I have a Kähler form omega x on the full space and I split it into two pieces, omega v and omega h. Omega v being the vertical part and omega h being the horizontal part. So mt is just a number operator plus the horizontal part of the Kähler form. So once I've, I have this, I, we have the following result. Again, take alpha t, which are the chain character forms I gave before, gamma t, which are the chain, I mean, it's, they are, these are not chain character forms, I introduce this funny number operator here, nt, exponential minus at squared. Then the following result is true, alpha t and gamma t are sums of pp forms, alpha t is closed, 
And d over dt of alpha t is now the d bar d of something, of 2 i pi, of gamma t over t. So this corresponds to double transgression, which is exactly the context in which both chain classes will appear. So what does the theorem say? It says again, in the context of holomorphic context, that alpha t as t tends to 0 is the integral along the fiber of some riemann roch grothendieck differential form. Now these characteristic classes here are calculated using the holomorphic emitting connections of the considered vector bundle. So this is perfectly alpha t as t tends to 0 converges to riemann roch grothendieck sort of form. As, alpha, as t tends to infinity, if the direct image is locally free, this corresponds to saying that the kernel of the Dirac operator along the fiber is a vector bundle. Alpha t is converges to the chain character of the direct image, that is, of the cohomology of the fiber. And again, by playing this transgression mechanism, by integrating this equation here from t equals 0 to plus infinity, we find that alpha infinity minus alpha 0 is given by the integral of 0 to infinity of this object here, which is gamma t over t. However, we meet immediately a difficulty is that this integral does not make sense. So of course this is uh, not really pleasant. However, when an integral does not make sense, we know a trick to give sense to it. We introduce some complex parameter s, t to the s, 1 over gamma of s, and we check that this function here as a function of s is easily seen to be holomorphic near 0. So actually, we simply take t to the s 1 over gamma of s, and we take the derivative at 0. And then it is true that the following equation holds alpha infinity minus alpha 0 is a d bar d of something. And this something here we will call higher analytic torsion forms. So this is, if you like, an analog of the eta tilde form in which the d operator has been replaced by a d bar d. Yes? It's, uh, it's at zero, of course. It's at zero. Yeah, at infinity there is no problem. So you could use other regularizations? I could use other, but I mean, there are many, of course, the point is, that one of the reasons why we use this one is that is Ray and Singer had used it. So we felt compelled to use that one. I mean, there are many other reasons, but of course there was a historical reason to use it. So I will comment a little bit later on. So this object here, which I produced now, solves the differential equation d bar d of the analytic torsion form is equal to the chain character of the direct image minus the integral along the fiber of the, say, Riemann-Roch-Gottendieck sort of form. So it's interesting to understand what is the part of degree 0 of this object. You could certainly look at the part of degree 0 here. And what you discover is that the part of degree 0 is, so the part of degree 0 is a function on the base. So you can just look at the single fiber. So this piece of degree 0 is just the so-called analytic torsion introduced by Ray and Singer. So let me remind you briefly what this is. So I introduce zeta p of s, which is simply the zeta function for the Laplacian along the fiber acting on p forms. So it's well known that zeta p is holomorphic at 0, extends holomorphically by result of zilli, and t of 0 is nothing else than the sum of minus 1 to the p plus 1 times p times the derivative at 0 of zeta p. Let me finally observe that if you have a zeta function like this, formally speaking, the derivative at 0 of a zeta function is minus the log of a determinant. So formally these derivatives, this t of 0, is a combination with certain powers of logarithm of determinants of Laplacians acting on forms of various degrees. So let me try to give you some interpretation of the above equation in degree 2. So 
by the theory of, di of direct images, we can in full generality construct some line bundle on the base. So lambda will be a holomorphic line bundle on the base S, which is called the determinant of the direct image. So I pi star is a direct image, and I take its inverse for some reason. So let me just comment a little bit to make maybe this clear, clearer. So the determinant of a finite dimensional vector space, it's simply its highest exterior power. The inverse of a line bundle is its dual. And so in that context, this determinant of the direct image has the property that for any s, the fiber lambda s is just some tensor product of determinants of Dolbo or Cher cohomology groups of Zs with values in the holomorphic vector bundle along the fiber. So this is a way actually of gluing all these fibers even if the cohomology groups, if the dimension jump. So I do give myself this line bundle. So I will try to, what I'm trying to do is interpret the above equation in degree two. So I construct a metric on this determinant line bundle, which is as follows. So this will be the Quillen metric with a double bar. So it is a product of two objects. The first one, I mean the second one, sorry, this is related to the Reisinger analytic torsion. It's exactly the exponential or minus one half of t degree zero. This is a Reisinger analytic torsion and times the so-called L2 metric. So the L2 metric is simply obtained by identifying the cohomology of the fibers. You identify them to the corresponding harmonic objects along the fiber, this by Hodge theory. And so since harmonic objects inherit an L2 metric, you can transfer this L2 metric to the determinant line bundle. So from the above equation, I find the following result that the first churn form of the holomorphic line bundle lambda equipped with the Quillen metric is given by the integral along the fiber of a grothendieck riemann rohr sort of differential form. This actually directly simply is a simple reformulation of the D-body equation which I wrote before. It's a direct simple reformulation but of course, the key fact about this theorem is that it extends in full generality to the case where the direct image is not locally free, and also to the case where the metric along the fiber is only fiberwise scalar via so-called anomaly formulas. In other words, it, it's much more general than the special case I looked at before in which the metrics along the fiber come from a common Kähler metric. So again, this sort of result should be viewed as a refinement at the level of differential forms of grothendieck riemann So again, you may ask yourself, how do the forms T of omega x and GE depend on the given metrics on the Kähler form omega x and the metric GE. So you see, these analytic torsion forms verify the following d bar d equation. So d bar d is difference of chain character minus integration along the fiber. On the other hand, you can refine chain Simon's theory. This refinement, uh, refinement actually was done by Bott and Chern in the following way. If you give yourself some characteristic polynomial, P, and a holomorphic vector bundle, E, equipped with two metrics, so by chern simons theory, we know that this difference of these two forms is the D of something. This is chern simons So what bott chern theory tells us is a canonical way of constructing a form P tilde, which solves a similar equation with a D bar D operator here. So the result, which looks actually simple, but which is unfortunately technically complicated, is the fact that this 
analytic torsion forms, when you vary the parameters, which define them, they do vary by, the, the variation can be expressed in terms of Bot-Chern classes. What makes the proof difficult here is the fact that we now are forced to work in the context of Kähler metrics, which introduce an extra rigidity with respect to the smooth category, which makes that usual, some sort of usual simple variation arguments do not work. So the fact that these analytic torsion forms vary themselves in terms of bot chain classes is a sort of miracle. So let me now briefly explain what, has, what functoriality is in that framework. So let me give myself now the composition of two submersions. So I give myself a big submersion here, P of V on S, which in itself is a product of two submersions. So I give myself metrics, and it turns out that by the above constructions to each of these arrows, I can associate higher analytic torsion forms. To this composed arrow, and to this first one, and this second one. So the theorem I'm going to, not to describe in detail, tells you that in some sense, there is a commutative diagram which is associated to this composition of maps. In the sense that since to each of these maps here there is a certain form which is associated to it, they have to verify compatibility conditions, natural compatibility conditions. And the theorem is that these compatibility conditions are verified. This again is not a direct result, I mean that's something that you really have to prove, and this was obtained by myself and Bertemieux and Ma. So for the moment I've concentrated on, on submersions, now let me move to immersions. So let I, Y into X, be an embedding of complex manifolds. Let F be a holomorphic vector bundle on Y. And let uh, EV be a complex of holomorphic vector bundles on X. This is on X which provides you with a resolution of f on y. So this means basically that you have some exact sequence of sheaves over x, ox if m, ox is 0, and there is a restriction map here which maps into the sheaf of holomorphic sections of f on y, and you want this exact sequence to be exact. So we do know that on projective manifolds, resolutions do exist. So in the context of holomorphic vector bundles or current sheaves, the direct image of F is simply defined to be E. So F is a vector bundle on Y. Its direct image will be a combination of vector bundles on X. So that's a definition. So what Riemann-Rohr-Grotendieck tells us is that in the cohomology of X, the chain character of E, which is a cohomology class on X, can be represented by the direct image of the chain character of F divided by the Todd of the normal bundle. So this is a consequence of Riemann-Rohr-Grotendieck. And again, the question arises, if we can represent both sides in terms of differential forms, can we solve some natural double transgression equation? Can we produce, in some set, can we produce canonically in some way, a current T of E and GE, this would be a current on X, which would solve the following current equation, D bar D of this with 2 i pi here, would be the difference of the chain character form of E associated with a given metric on E. And here you would have a chain vial again, theoretic form. Of course here, this will be a current of integration on Y. So can we construct T? Can we say something about its variation in terms of the parameters? And can we say something about its functoriality? 
So basically, I have to start again my talk, like a nightmare at least for you. <laughs> so I consider the complex EV. Uh, let me remind you a few things about EV. The fact that it's a resolution says in particular two things. First of all, that EV is a cyclic as a complex on the complement of Y. And the second thing is that the homology of Y, of, of the complex E on Y, so the complex E will not be a cyclic on Y, but essentially what you can say is that the homology of this complex restricted to Y can be evaluated very simply in terms of the exterior algebra of the normal bundle and of the vector bundle which you've taken the resolution of. So my basic assumption is I will introduce metrics on E which are direct sum of metrics, GE, direct sum of GEI, and metrics on N and F so that this identification here will become an isometry. I ask that on Y, this canonical identification is an isometry, again using at some point finite dimensional Hodge theory to identify the homology of this complex, of the complex EV, to a subspace, to a sub-bundle of the complex itself. So this will be my assumption on the metrics. So now, as Jeff says, here are the superconnections back, back again. I take V star to be the adjoint of V. V is V plus V star, so this is a morphism operating inside the complex. And I introduce a superconnection AT, which is a sum of the holomorphic Hermitian connection on E plus square root of TV. I introduce again as before alpha T, the supertrace of exponential minus AT square, gamma T, the supertrace with some normalization factor of the number operator exponential minus AT square. So again, I write the fake heat equation formula, which says that d alpha T over dt is a d bar d of the gets this form gamma T. This is what I said before. And now again, I find that these forms alpha T interpolate nicely between the currents as described before. Tautologically, alpha zero is the Chan character form of the vector bundle E. And as T tends to infinity, alpha T converges as a current to the Chan vibe theoretic current, Chan character of F divided by the top of the normal bundle, current of integration on Y. So there are two simple ideas to prove this. The first is that Y should be viewed as a sort of potential well whose potential is V square. So V square is just V plus V star to the square. And I remind you that this operator is invertible on the complement of Y. To the contrary, V square is non-invertible. It acquires some zero eigenvalues on Y. And so this makes already that on the complement of Y, the exponential minus 80 square decays very quickly as t tends to infinity. So this is the first aspect of the proof. And the second part is using a formula of Matai Quiller. So once we have this, we can actually play again the game I gave before. So really, the formulas are exactly the same. The only difference is that now we are talking about currents on a given manifold x. I write alpha infinity minus alpha 0 is a d bar d over 2 i pi, exactly the same formula as before. I have again the difficulty of making this integral converge. But I again imitate Ray Singer. If an integral does not converge, I find there a way to make it converge. I put a t to the s. And of course, I should not forget 1 over gamma of s, which I did. Take the derivative at 0. And now I find that I've produced this way a certain current, T of E and G E, which solves the current equation I gave before here. D bar D of T is just a difference of these two currents, of these two natural currents. 
plus an extra fact, which is actually quite important, which is that the wavefront set, the wavefront set measures micro locally the, the non-smoothness of the current. So this current is certainly non-smooth near Y, but nevertheless, its non-smoothness is really well controlled. Its wavefront set is included in the conormal bundle to Y into X. So let me just give a simple example of such objects T. I just give, take the simplest example. I give myself a divisor, say. Imagine that Y is simply a divisor inside X, and that EV is a two-step complex, which is minus D, C, and here is multiplication by the canonical section, sigma D, of the divisor. So in that case, I give myself a metric, GD, on the corresponding divisor, on the corresponding line bundle, and then in this case, T of E is just a log of the canonical section squared divided by the normalizing factor, which is a tod of D. And this equation here then becomes a version of a Poincaré Lelong sort of equation. Again, in this context, it's natural to ask for functoriality in the same way as I had pre proved or explained to you functoriality with respect to composition of submersions. I now can prove functoriality with respect to composition of embeddings. So basically, you give yourself two manifolds, y and y prime, embed into x, y intersection y prime. So you look at this diagram. In a certain context, to each of these arrows, you can associate currents on X. And I'm happy to tell you, without giving much detail, that again, this diagram commutes in some way. OK, so it commutes in the sense that these refined objects still understand riemann rohr grothendieck in their own way. And the diagram commutes in the right category in which this object lives. OK, so my talk is not over. Because now, of course, once you've done this, you see, in the context of riemann rohr you know well that really where things start, in some sense, to be hard is when you have to address the following question. To what extent are the objects we introduced with submersions compatible or related to the objects we associated to immersions? So basically, what I'm going to do is the following thing. I give myself a family of embeddings. So a family of embeddings means a parameterized family of holomorphic submanifolds y into x. Or if you like, I give myself two vibrations, p pi w s with fiber y, pi v s with fiber x. And of course, W embeds into V, and the fiber Y embeds into X. So again now, to each of these arrows, I will have some secondary object. So for instance, the object associated to this arrow here, which corresponds to the fiber X, is an analytic torsion form on the base S, so it's a sum of PP forms on the base S, which is, in some sense, uh, refines on riemann rohr grothendieck atiyah singer index theorem for families. The second object is itself associated to the smooth, to the small vibration, in other words, to this arrow here. And finally, I have a current, which measures the difference between W and V. So some sort of the final step in this theory is showing exactly a compatibility formula between objects which come from submersions and objects which come from immersions. So let me try briefly to explain this result, which I proved with, with Lebeau. 
which tells you essentially that a natural combination of objects associated to some motion, so this is a combination of analytic torsion forms with respect to the small vibration and the big vibration, this one I will not explain in detail, can be expressed in local terms. So, to explain why we should expect that such a formula holds, I should say that when we take, apply the d bar d operator on both sides of the equation, we get something which is tautologically true. So, again, the question, the point about this theorem here is to know to what extent an equality which is tautologically true at the level of differential forms can be lifted at this refined level. Actually, so I will not comment on these various objects. I mean, these are, again, Botchen sort of objects. Here you see appearing the current associated with the immersion. So here the ones for submersion, here for the immersion. And here you see some extra funny term, some extra funny characteristic class which appears in this result, which I will briefly comment upon, which is the following power series introduced by Gillet and uh, Soule, which is the following power series R of X, which is expressed in this way in terms of the Riemannian of the Riemann zeta function. What's remarkable about this is that it involves derivatives of the Riemann zeta function, while it's well known that usually in usual characteristic classes you only see values of zeta function negative integers. You see here the derivatives of the zeta function. So let me try to explain briefly what this the theorem says concretely in degree zero. Let me try to explain what this says in degree zero. Well, it says simply the following thing. So you have, you, you have now a big fiber X and a small fiber Y. We have a certain determinant line, lambda of F, which is constructed on Y. A determinant lambda of E constructed on X, and E resolves F. So these two lines are canonically isomorphic. In some sense, they come from the same cohomology. So you took the cohomology of Y, of F and Y, you resolve it in X, and you get a new object which itself calculates the cohomology on Y. However, the Quillen metrics are essentially different. One of the Quillen metrics is constructed on Y, is related to the spectral theory of Y and the other one is related to the spectral theory of X. What the formula tells you is that the ratio of the two Quillen metrics, one coming from the spectral theory of X and the other coming from the spectral theory of Y, the ratio of these two Quillen metrics is itself can be expressed as a local explicit formula. So, I will just try now to just to state uh, the arithmetic Riemann-Rohr theorem of Gillet and uh, Soule. So, let me remind you that before I gave a result saying that some eta tilde form could be expressed as the integral along the fiber of a differential character. What we want to do, and that's actually what Gilles and Soule have done, has been to construct an extension of the theory of differential characters, which is refined with respect to that one, and which actually maps into it, so that the previous objects that are introduced can be thought of as themselves being refined differential characters in that category. So maybe to put it briefly, I give myself F to be a projective flat map between arithmetic varieties. These are varieties over spec of Z. 
So in that category, we have a new notion of direct image. So you introduce, they introduce some arithmetic K group. So these are essentially algebraic vector bundles on the manifold X with metric. And you have a notion of direct image in that category. So the theorem of Gilles Soulet is such as exactly to extend the above formula in refined differential characters. So they introduce some CH group, which is some refined Chow group, which will receive the chain character of K hat of X. So this goes into some refined Chow group. This actually incorporates also me metric and cycle information. And the theorem of Gilles et Soulet says that in that category, you do have a riemann grothendieck sort of theorem, which actually takes exactly the form of the classical riemann The only difference is that you have to slightly modify the thought class so uh, to incorporate the R genus I introduced before. So let me give you, uh, I won't give the proof of this result, I just explained briefly in a few lines uh, the principle of the proof. So the first thing is, of course, to define the objects. So you have to define the k hat of x. These are the extended Grothendieck group with metric. And ch of x, which is a refined ch group, which again refined on differential characters. This refined ch group is itself constructed via algebraic cycles on one hand, and Botchen-like currents on the other hand. Botchen-like currents are just, you can think of them as related to Chen Simons, to Cheeger Simons differential characters. The basic di difference being that the D equation, the D operator is replaced by D bar D. And so basically, to prove this refined Riemann-Roch, you show the compatibility of this formula to follow the classic, the, the, the initial Grothendieck strategy to prove riemann roch which is to show compatibility to embeddings of this formula. This is the formula with Lebeau I explained before. This is the first step. This is essentially the step I gave before. And establish the result for Pn of C. So actually, Gillet and Soule produced this R series by simply assuming that there was some Riemann-Roch theorem at the time that did not know really in what category, computing things for Pn, which involved essentially calculating some spectral invariant, which was the analytic torsion, and they produced this series here by brute force. So it was actually quite a nightmare to imagine how would an analytic proof itself produced an, an, such an object. And it was a big surprise to see that actually analytically this object appears simply to be the analytic torsion form associated to just a, a simple vibration which is just a vector bundle. Essentially it just comes from a, it's a characteristic class which you calculate using harmonic oscillators along the fibers of the vector bundle. Now the coincidence of these two constructions of R, one via spectral theory on Pn, and the other more related to physics via harmonic oscillators, has been recently completely explained by Bost and Rössler in the sense that they showed that the computation on the projective space given by Gillet and Soulet is a consequence of the embedding theorem. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Are there um, any questions? Yeah. Um, so actually, to test my earlier question, you could imagine then that you have to modify the capital R formula if you use other regularization. 
Yeah, I mean, you see, it's like in riemann rohr If you have a formula, you can always decide that part of the right-hand side is put on the left-hand side, and then you get another formula. Right, so once you start from a formula, all other formulas can be obtained by adding the same thing on both sides. <laughs> so, this is what your suggestions amount to, I think. And I even saw a paper whose main result was this, that you could modify both sides, adding the same thing on both sides, so you would get a new. <laughs> well, the paper has not appeared yet. <laughs> now, I have two questions. Yes? I, I, I think I understand the comment, this thing about emergent versus embedding because of the conversation with Flavio and he explained to me the history of the original transcribing stuff and what it has to do with that. In my generation, we always think of that name no Yes? But my question is this. My first question is, we, uh, secondary characteristic classes that find that they use the information in that formula. Yes. Has any work been done on using this to get more information in the No. Do you think it's possible? I mean, you see, typically what this result tells you, I mean, let, let me just explain briefly my understanding of how, the, how this result is put to use. So basically, if you have an algebraic manifold, you take the cohomology of some algebraic vector bundle. And inside you have some integral letters, which are the sections which are integral. I mean, so you, which are integral. They are the really the truly algebraic ones. So you put yourself a complex, you look at the complex cohomology, and inside you have some lattice. So what the formula tells you is what is the volume of, in some sense, a, the quotient of the cohomology by the lattice with respect to the Quillen metric. Okay? So the Quillen metric gives you some volume on this thing. And the formula gives you an explicit formula for this volume in terms of explicit characteristic classes. That's what it tells you. So the reason why you're interested in knowing this is that in the context of Minkowski, knowing Minkowski theorem, this allows you, in some sense, if you know some things about this volume, you can count how many sections, how many integral sections there are of some vector bundle, and potentially to count the number of solutions of some Diophantine equations. Yes. 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 So this, I don't. I mean, I know, of course, Bart Chen introduced them actually in the context of the van Lina theory, which is closely related in some sense to Arakelov. So they also introduced them to count also a certain number of solutions. So it has, it has been used this way. I don't know of any use in context of collisions. And in the second equation, I was my foliage. The secondary sense can be used to count on the foliage, which is actually the But what I was also going to ask was, and I don't know if it's Ravanelli, in the non-algebraic case, Sheriff Simon was the non-algebraic Well, I mean, I think that... Yeah, but, I mean, Bot Chen, Bot, Bot Chen has have appeared in, in Donaldson's work, in Tian's work, and so on. Uh, this refinement, no, no. I don't know of it, no. Do you think it's possible? I hope so. <laughs> Are there any further questions? In that case, let's thank the speaker again.